The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on nonlinear finite element analysis of solids and structures. In this lecture, I'd like to discuss with you structural elements. Structural elements are, of course, employed to model beam, plate, and shell structures and are most important elements. Because of their importance in engineering practice, much research and development effort has been focused on the development of efficient structural elements. In this and the next lecture, I'd like to discuss with you some modern effective elements. We will first dis discuss shell elements and then beam elements and then we go back to use uh, the shell elements, the concept that we discussed in some actual applications. Uh, when we do structural analysis, we should keep one matter in mind, namely that in a geometrically nonlinear analysis, a flat shell, referred to as a plate, becomes very rapidly uh, or goes very rapidly over into the behavior of a shell because of the curvature that develops as the plate deforms. Therefore, to analyze geometrically nonlinear plates, we really are quite well off using general shell elements. And I'd like to now focus our attention on the development of general shell elements that we actually then employ to analyze plates as well as general shells. There are various solution approaches that one can follow for the development of efficient elements. And one such approach is uh, the use of general beam and shell theories. I'm thinking of beams as well as shells, although I want to focus our attention on shells, really, in this first lecture. Uh, one starts with a beam or shell theory as general as possible and develops the governing differential equations from the governing differential equation, one develops variational formulations and one discretizes those variational formulations using finite element interpolations. This is the approach that is taken. The disadvantage of that approach is, in general, lack of generality of the approach. You're starting off with a particular shell theory, beam theory. You, of course, would like to have that shell theory as general as possible. But in, you will find that really the shell theory that you're starting off will mostly only be applicable to a certain class of shells. Therefore, you find that elements that you're developing will also be only applicable to that same class of shells. And that means in engineering practice, in actual usage, the user has to be very familiar for which this particular element developed, as shown here, or discussed now, uh, for what kinds of shells this particular shell element is really applicable. We would rather like to have shell elements that are applicable to any shell. Of course, this is a very big aim, very difficult to achieve, but this is what we would like to have ideally in engineering practice. The other uh, difficulty or uh, with this approach is that frequently a large number of nodal degrees of freedom have to be carried along in the development of the shell elements. And what I'm thinking of there is that you don't just have translations and rotations at the nodal points, which are the engineering degrees of freedom that we would like to have and see in for the element, but you also have to have additional degrees of freedoms relating to the curvatures in the elements and so on. So uh, this, of course, would mean or does mean a difficult use of such elements and these reasons, these two reasons here, have really uh, driven the research and development efforts in different directions. Another approach is to use simple elements, uh, simple elements but a large number of elements then to model beam, very complex beam and shell structures. As an example, I like to just refer you to a three-node triangular flat element in which the plate bending behavior is modeled in a particular way and the plane stress behavior is modeled as a constant strain, constant stress element. 
these two are superimposed, these two behaviors are superimposed, and you have a very simple shell element that in certain analyses can be quite effective. Uh, of course, we have to recognize in this approach that the coupling between the membrane and bending action is only introduced at the element nodes. That is a major disadvantage and that is the reason why you need so many elements to model a shell and that if we use a triangular three-noded element uh, with just a constant strain, constant stress uh, element to model the membrane behavior, the membrane action, of course, the membrane action is quite poorly approximated and one other, that is another reason why we need so many elements to model a complex shell behavior. Here, uh, on this view graph, I'm showing a picture of the element that I just referred to. Here you have a triangular element in the three-dimensional space. Notice we introduce a local coordinate system, x, x bar 2, x bar 3, x bar 1. Local coordinate system and in this local coordinate system we measure the displacements and rotations and we superimpose for this element the bending behavior. The bending behavior corresponding to this degree of freedom, that degree of freedom, and this degree of freedom at every node, of course. We add or superimpose onto this bending behavior the membrane behavior, which corresponds to these two degrees of freedom. And we immediately notice that corresponding to this degree of freedom, we don't have a real physical stiffness. And we introduce a little artificial stiffness as shown down here. Now, this artificial stiffness has to be selected. Uh, and you want to select it such as to take out the singularity out of the system, but yet make the stiffness not too big so as to destroy the behavior of the element. And because it's an artificial stiffness, you really want to make it as small as possible just to take out the singularity out of this element when you apply this element in the modeling of general shell structures. This artificial st stiffness actually is quite bothersome. Uh, in nonlinear analysis, uh, it can provide problems and we really don't like it. But if we use this approach, we have to introduce it and, uh, well, we have to, so to say, live with it, with the difficulties that, that we encounter. But the other approach that I want to discuss with you really quite extensively in these two lectures, namely using the isoparametric elements, having curved elements there as well, uh, they don't, we don't introduce this artificial stiffness anymore because our experiences of introducing it in nonlinear analysis uh, are uh, show us that there are many difficulties that come into the analysis procedure if you have this artificial stiffness. So we got rid of it. We don't introduce it any longer for the more modern elements that I will be talking about uh, just now. The approach for these modern elements is to use isoparametric interpolations. And we talk then about the isoparametric degenerate beam and shell elements degenerate because we de degenerate these elements, or we obtain these elements, I should say, by degeneration from three-dimensional behavior. We will talk much more about it just now. Uh, but in essence, we are saying we take the 3D continuum equations and we degenerate those equations to the particular shell behavior and beam behavior for beams that we would like to capture. The resulting elements can be used to model quite general beam and shell structures. And that is, of course, a very large advantage in engineering practice that you can use the same elements to model a variety of uh, structures. The basic approach of this isoparametric interpolation is to use the total and updated Lagrangian formulations that we developed earlier. We talked in the earlier lectures quite extensively about the total and updated Lagrangian formulation, the continuum mechanics equations, as well as the 
finite element discretization of the continuum mechanics equations, but we applied the finite element discretization only to 2D and 3D solid elements. Now we want to do the same for shell elements. We recall that the, in the TL formulation, the governing equation is this one here, and which is nothing else than the principle of virtual work operating on the second pillar Kirchhoff stress and the variation on the Green-Lagrange strain. This integral is taken over the original volume of the structure of the element when we develop a finite element. Uh, and this is, of course, the internal virtual work. And here we have the external virtual work. Notice the linearization of this left integral here resulted into these three integrals. We went through that linearization in quite some detail. And we talked about the individual terms. Uh, I don't think it's now necessary to review that material uh, anymore. Please refer to the earlier lectures. The same of approach, of course, we used also for the UL formulation. Here is the general starting point, the principle of virtual work now, using second pillar Kirchhoff stresses referred to the configuration at time t. Variations in the greener ground strains refer to the time configuration at time t. This gives the internal virtual work corresponding to time t plus delta t, t plus delta t. And this is the external virtual work, same external virtual work, of course, that we are having in the total Lagrangian formulation. The linearization of the left-hand side integral here results into these three integrals. Once again, we talked about that linearization quite extensively. And if you refer to the early lectures, surely you recognize the individual terms that you're seeing here now. We use these governing equations for the total Lagrangian and updated Lagrangian formulation to develop the general shell elements. And what we have to do now is to impose on these equations the basic assumptions of beam and shell action. And let us go now through these basic assumptions one by one carefully. The first assumption is that the material particles originally on a straight line normal to the mid-surface of the beam or the shell remain on that straight line throughout the response history. This is one most important assumption. You must have encountered this assumption, or at least some form of it, already earlier in uh, your discussion of beam series and possibly shell series. Let's look at this assumption more closely, though. For beams, we would say plane sections initially normal to the mid-surface remain plane sections during the response history. This is basically saying the same thing, what I just said earlier. Uh, and you, if you look at this closely, you recognize that we do not say that the plane sections initially normal to the mid-surface remain plane sections during the response history and remain normal to the mid-surface. We don't say that. That's, of course, being said when you use the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. We don't say this, that the plane sections remain normal to the mid-surface throughout the response history. We don't say that. And because we don't say that, we, in effect, include in an approximate way shear deformations. In other words, if we look here, the effect of transverse shear deformations is included. And hence, the lines initially normal to the mid-surface do not remain normal to the mid-surface during the deformations. Let's look at what this means pictorially. Here we have a section of a beam at time 0. And we draw a line normal, that is at 90 degrees, to the mid-surface, shown as a dashed line. And we identify particles on that line. Here we have four such red material particles. Now the beam will move, deform, go through large displacements, large rotations. But actually, we assume small strains. And we see that these material particles, which were originally up here, are now down here. We identify that these material particles are still on a straight line. But this straight line is not any more normal, that is at 90 degrees, to the mid-surface. And because it is not any more normal to the mid-surface, we have included, we do include, 
shear deformations approximately because we assume that the shear deformations are constant throughout the thickness of the beam. This is a most important assumption. We're looking here what uh, looks like a beam, but actually it, if you think of a, another dimension here, you can directly see that the same picture is also applicable to the motion of a shell. The second important assumption is that the stress in the direction normal to the beam or shell mid-surface is zero throughout the response history. In other words, there is no stress developed normal to the mid-surface, but notice that here the stress along the material fiber that is initially normal to the mid-surface is considered. Now this material fi fiber, which is initially normal to the mid-surface, will not remain normal to the mid-surface, as I just said. And in the motion, we will consider always the stress in the direction of that material fiber we was, which was originally normal to the mid-surface. So after motion has taken place, we are not really talking anymore exactly. If you want to look in great detail at what's happening, we don't talk anymore exactly about the stress that is normal to the current mid-surface, but we always talk about the stress in the direction of the fiber that was initially normal to the mid-surface. That's being said here. Uh, and the third assumption, also most important assumption, is that the thickness of the beam or shell remains constant. Here then we clearly identify that we are using really a small, we are assuming small strain conditions, but we allow for very large displacements and rotations. Well, with these three kinematic and static assumptions clearly identified, we are now ready to actually develop these shell element interpolations. And let's uh, go at that. The first point is that we incorporate the geometric assumptions, straight lines, normal to the mid-surface, remain straight, putting, put here in quotes that geometric assumption, and the geometric assumption that the shell thickness remains constant throughout the whole motion. These were two assumptions that we just discussed. We incorporate that into our shell element formulation by using the appropriate geometric and displacement interpolations. We incorporate the condition of zero stress normal to the mid-surface. I put it in quotes here because remember we're talking about the stress in the direction of the fiber that was originally normal to the mid-surface. We incorporate this condition by using the appropriate stress-strain law. Let's talk first about this assumption and then about this assumption, how we are using these to actually develop our shell elements. To focus our attention, I like to talk about a nine-node element. However, we will later on see that in practice, actually, we don't use the nine-node element very much. We actually recommend the use of a 16-node element and a four-node element. But this nine-node element in some analyses is also used. And uh, it certainly is an element that sh with which I can discuss with you, share with you all the experiences regarding the formulation of the elements. Because what we're talking about now really is applicable to any of the elements. In fact, we're talking about variable number nodes elements, where the number of nodes can be selected uh, by the analyst. Uh, and the geometric assumptions that we're now talking about are the same for any one of these elements. How do we go about the formulation? Well, one important point is that we introduce at each node lying on the mid-surface, and here we see such nine nodes, a director vector, a director vector T, V, N, K, T referring already to the geometry at time T. Of course, this director vector is actually input by the analyst for time zero, and then it evolves with the motion of the shell. Also, we are introducing for the analysis, and that's being done automatically in the computer program, these two vectors here, TV1K and TV2K, which are normal 
to the director vector. These vectors are calculated automatically in the computer program. We talk more about it a little later. Notice that the thickness here at this node is AK, and notice that VNK at node K, K of course stands for that node, acts into the direction of the thickness here. Notice that such triad of vectors is, of course, being worked with at each of these nodes. And notice that the thickness at the nodes can change. The element is defined as follows. As far as the analyst is concerned, the initial nodal point coordinates of all the nodal points on the mid-surface must be input. Also, the initial director vector must be input. Here now you see the zero. And the thickness at every node must be input. Notice if these director vectors at all of the nodes are known, with the thicknesses at the nodes, of course, then we can interpolate the thickness for any, at any point of the mid-surface of the shell, and we can interpolate the director vector corresponding to a, any point on the mid-surface. Here is such point on the mid-surface. We get the thickness at that point from the thicknesses that we have here and from the director vectors. And of course, we're also getting the director vector at this point from these director vectors. So the analyst must put in the nodal point coordinates of the mid-surface nodes and the direction cosines of these director vectors. Much of it, of course, can be generated in a practical analysis. We use an isoparametric coordinate system with coordinates r, s, and t. The coordinates r and s correspond to, are measured in the mid-surface. Uh, the coordinate t is, measure, is measured in the direction of the director vectors. The geometry at time 0 is interpolated as shown here in this equation. 0xi is, gives us the coordinates, 3, i goes from 1 to 3, of any material particle in the stationary coordinate frame. I should point out once more, very strongly, that we use a stationary Cartesian coordinate frame, x1, x2, x3, to describe the geometry of the element and to work with our element. The, these coordinate frame x1, x2, x3 is stationary. In that stationary coordinate frame, of course, we are me measuring the coordinates of any material part particle corresponding to time 0, corresponding to time t, etc. The same way as we discussed it in earlier lectures when we talked about the analysis of solids, 2D and 3D solids, and when we talked about the continuum mechanics equations. So here, this coordi these coordinates of the material particles as the material particles are moving through the stationary coordinate frame, are given by the right-hand side. And what do we see here? k is 1 to n. n is the number of nodes. For the elements that I've shown you, n would be 9. h, k are the interpolation functions corresponding to the two-dimensional surface of the element. In other words, these HKs are really the 2D interpolation functions as we are used to see them for plane stress, plane strain, and axisymmetric analysis. Same interpolation functions. These are the nodal point coordinates at time 0. Here we have T, that is the third isoparametric coordinate. We talked about it just now. K going from 1 to n again. AK are the thicknesses at the nodal points. HK here is exactly the same HK that we see here. And these are the direction cosines of the director vectors. Director vector N means director vector. K or normal, N really stands for normal, but it's really the director vector, referring to the director vector. K, of course, the node. 0 means time 0, and I means the components the three components of the director vector. That's what we're looking at here. Now, if you leave this term out, 
then you would have simply the interpolation of the mid-surface as for a membrane element. Of course, curved mid-surface. This term here is added in to take into account the effect of the shell thickness. Similarly, at time t, we have, applying the same interpolation, Txi here now. Here we have Txik, same Hk that we talked about earlier, same summing that we talked about just now. Here now Tvnik, the direction cosines of the director vectors, director vector k at time t now. Notice that all we have done in this term and in that term is to substitute for the zero that we had here and that we had there, the t now. Of course, this t means time t. This t here means coordinate t. That's why we put a circle around it and wrote it out there once more. This is the coordinate, the isoparametric coordinate t. Rs coordinates go in here. t coordinate goes in there. What has happened here is that originally our director vector might look like shown in this picture here. The node coordinates are given here, 0xik, and in the time from time 0 to time t, this director vector moves to look as shown now here, and of course the nodal point itself has moved as well. So it's these quantities here, these red quantities, that we're using here, which carry the curl. Well, to obtain the displacements of any material particle within the shell, we proceed now exactly in the same way as we have proceeded in the development of 3D solid elements. We take the interpolation for the geometry at time t, subtract the interpolation for the geometry at time 0, and we get the displacements corresponding to time t. The result is this equation here. Here we have the displacements of any material particle in the shell. Here we have the nodal point displacements from time 0 to time t. Here we have the director, vector at, director vectors at time t, so to say, minus the director vectors at time 0. Really, these are the direction cosines corresponding to the direction, director vector at time t minus the direction cosines of the director vector corresponding at time 0. Uh, of course, this quantity here is obtained via this equation, and that quantity here is uh, simply obtained by subtracting the right-hand sides corresponding to Txi and 0xi, the way you just have seen it, have seen them on the previous view graphs. Uh, the incremental displacement from time t to time t plus delta t is similarly obtained from this relationship here. And the result is shown here, where now we have here the increments in the nodal point displacements. And here we have the increments in the direction cosines of the director vectors from time t to time t plus delta t. The equation is given right there. Well, with the equations that we have developed so far, we are almost ready to establish the strain displacement matrices for the TL and UL formulations of the element. We have the coordinate interpolations for the material particles. We discussed those. And we have, at the moment, also the interpolation of the incremental displacements of the material particles in the shell element in terms of nodal point incremental displacements and the increments of the direction cosines of the director vectors at the nodal points. What we, however, want is to have the incremental displacements in terms of the nodal point displacements and nodal point rotations. The nodal point rotations, because the incremental nodal point displacements and nodal point rotations are the engineering uh, type quantities that we can nicely deal with in a computer program when we analyze shell structures. So what we want is to express Vnik 
the increments in the direction cosines of the director vectors from time t to time t plus delta t in terms of the nodal point rotations. And that is achieved as follows. Here we have the stationary coordinate frame, x1, x2, x3. E1 is a vector into the x1 direction, E2 the vector into the x2 direction, E3 the vector into the x3 direction. Here we show Vn k for nodal point k, in other words a director vector, at time zero. This one is input by the analyst. These two are calculated in the program. And of course there are such two for every nodal point k for every nodal point k we also put in a director vector. Now the convention that is used, that can be used for v1 and v2 calculations, that convention is given down here. Notice that if vn points into the e3 direction, then v1 points into the 1 direction and v2 points into the 2 direction, by that I mean into the e1 and into the e2 direction. Uh, notice this is a detail that when Vn points into the E2 direction, this formula breaks down and you need to use some other convention. But that is a detail. We don't really need to uh, discuss that very much here now. Anyways, let us say then at every nodal point K, Vn has been input by the user, V1, V2 calculated by the computer program we notice that these two are once again perpendicular to Vn. Then we can directly say that the increment in the direction cosines of the vector, the director vector, is given via this relationship here. Now I've written this down already for time t. Of course it also holds for time zero. All you do is substitute for t, zero. It holds, in fact, for any time of the motion that we are considering. Let's see why this holds. Well, this picture here shows what's happening. Ne here we have Vn. Here we have V2. Here we have V1. Notice alpha is the rotation about V1. Beta is the rotation about V2. Notice that with the rotation beta about V2 here, we of course have an increment in this vector shown by this component because this here is now Vn at time t plus delta t when alpha k is 0. When alpha k is 0. Now, of course, you would also have the alpha k component coming in, and that means you have to add also this term. Notice that once you have obtained this vector, you want to normalize its length again. But this picture here shows why this term is the correct term to use in this formula, and you can extend this picture to also include this term. With this relationship, we can substitute for Vn, and that's now done in this equation. We have substituted for Vn and have now our increments in the displacements for the material particle within the shell in terms of nodal point incremental displacements and rotations about these V1 and V2 axes that we defined. Well, having established this interpolation for the incremental displacements and, of course, the interpolations for the geometries of the element at time 0, at time t, we can directly establish the strain displacement matrices and we will see we can then set up the k-matrix, the f-vector, the elements that go into the equilibrium equations the way we discussed it in the earlier lectures. And from the solution of k u equals r or k delta u equals delta r in nonlinear analysis, we of course get our nodal point rotations, alpha k and beta k, 
And once we have calculated these nodal point rotations, we obtain via this relationship here the Vn at time t plus delta t. In other words, what we're doing really here is we uh, integrate over all of the angle alpha k and beta k to get a more accurate approximation for the nodal point vector, uh, or the director vector, I should say, at time t plus delta t. Notice that if you do this integration in one step with the Euler forward method, you get back the equation that we had earlier on the view graph, and which I uh, tried to uh, explain or discuss with you using this picture that you saw. And I mentioned also that after this integration, of course, we want to normalize the length of this vector to make it always a unit length vector. We recognize that with this approach, we have only five degrees of freedom per node, three translations in the Cartesian coordinate directions, which are stationary, and two rotations refer to the local nodal point vectors v1 and v2 at time t. Now notice in geometric nonlinear analysis, of course, this vector and that vector, tv1 and tv2, change. So our change direction. So our alpha k and beta k are rotations that are measured about changing directions. Uh, that is an important point to recognize. Let's look at one uh, pictorial representation of what's happening. Here we have node k. We have a smooth shell, say, that is discretized using four shell elements. I've taken one shell element away, as shown here, so that we can look into the shell. And at that node, we have, as shown now, v1 and v2 at time t and the director vector corresponding to time t, we measure at that time alpha k and beta k about v1 and v2. And we also measure the displacements of the node u1, u2, u3. So notice that this node moves as shown. These are the three translational degrees of freedom. And this director vector here moves to a new position and also changes direction. And that new director vector, of course, is given here in red. Notice that there is no physical stiffness corresponding to the rotation about the director vector. No physical stiffness. The five degrees of freedom that the element very naturally carries are u1, u2, u3, alpha k, beta k, alpha and beta at every node k. Uh, if only shell elements connect to node k, and the node k is not subjected to boundary prescribed rotations, then we only need to assign these five degrees of freedom to the node and only work with these five degrees of freedom at that node. However, if we deal with a node to which also beam element is connected, uh, which of course in general has three rotational degrees of freedom, or a node on which a boundary rotation other than alpha k or beta k is imposed, then we transform the two nodal rotations, alpha k and beta k, to the three Cartesian axes. Because this way we can directly deal then with the, with the connection here and the imposition of the uh, boundary rotation. We can do so directly using the three rotations now measured in the Cartesian uh, axis directions. Uh, I mentioned already that the above interpolations for uh, 0xi, Txi, and Ui, in other words, for the original geometry, the current geometry, and the incremental displacements. The way we have developed uh, them, they can directly be used to obtain the strain displacement transformation matrices. And we really do so in the same way as for the 3D solid elements, which we discussed in an earlier lecture.
Uh, however, there's one matter to re recognize, and I briefly pointed that out also already in the earlier lecture, that using this expression here, and I now must refer to the earlier material that we discussed, uh, using this expression to obtain the strain displacement matrix, we realize that we obtain the exact linear strain displacement matrix. However, using this expression here to develop the nonlinear strain displacement matrix, T0 BNL, for the shell element, only an approximation to the exact second order strain displacement rotation expression is obtained because the internal element displacements depend nonlinear on the nodal point rotations. I pointed that out earlier. Please refer back to that discussion uh, to obtain a deeper understanding of what I mean here. Uh, the important point, of course, is that we do obtain the exact linear strain displacement matrix. So at convergence in an iteration, iteration k delta u equals delta r, when we have converged, we actually have the exact solution to the model that we're using, of course. So this is important that we obtain the appropriate and exact T0 BL matrix. The effect of what's, what we are neglecting here uh, was earlier mentioned, and please uh, refer back to that lecture. We finally need to still impose the condition that the stress in the direction normal to the shell mid surface is zero. Remember, this was one further assumption that we discussed at the beginning of this lecture. We use the direction of the director vector as a normal direction. This means that at each Gauss integration point within the element at which we want to evaluate the stress strain law, we first of all set up a system of vectors. E bar R, E bar S, E T, that are mutually perpendicular. Now let's look here into the picture above, and we see here at a particular Gauss point schematically shown, the vector E R and E S, which are vectors corresponding to the R and S axes. E T is a vector corresponding to the direction of the director vector at that point. Point. ET we accept as the normal direction at, for the shell at that point, and we construct E bar S and E bar R to be vectors perpendicular to ET and to themselves. And that is achieved by this relationship here. Having now est established ET e bar r and e bar s, we use this stress strain law. And by this I mean, let's look first what's in these round brackets. We use this stress strain law corresponding to these directions. In other words, the directions e bar r, e bar s, and e t, where this is the normal direction. This corresponds to the normal direction e t. Notice. By putting zeros here, we impose the fact that into the direction ET, we have a zero stress. Of course, this matrix is symmetric. Notice we have K here, which is a shear correction factor applied to the transverse shear stresses in the shell. Uh, nu, of course, is Poisson's ratio, and E is Young's modulus. Now, this is the material law corresponding to ET, E bar R, E bar S. And what we now have to do is transform this material law at every integration point to the global directions. Global directions because for the global x1, x2, x3 directions, we have established the B, the strain displacement matrices. And that gives us this material law C shell. This QSHT, QSH, is, I think, quite well known. Let me show you the form of it briefly. It's a transformation matrix where we show some of the terms here, as you can see. And these terms L1, M1, N1, 
etc. are defined down here. And L1, for example, is nothing else but the cosine of the angle between E1 and E bar R. Uh, in other words, it's a transformation matrix that you are probably quite familiar with in linear analysis. It's the matrix that transforms the stress and strain components from one coordinate system to the other coordinate system. And of course, the coordinate systems that we are transforming, uh, that we are using here, are the bar, E bar, R, E bar, S, E, T coordinate system on the one side and E1, E2, E3 on the other side. Well, the, using this matrix, we assure that the columns and rows 1, 2, 3 in C, S, H reflect that the stress normal to the shell mid surface is zero. This holds true because, remember, if we go back once more to the view graph, we have set this column and corresponding row to zero elements. And of course, this means that the stress normal to the shell surface is zero. I should also uh, briefly point out that we have a plane stress condition corresponding to the other uh, direction of stresses. In other words, the uh, E bar R and E bar S direction stresses. We have a plane stress condition, as you can see here. And of course, this term would go with it as well. This term and these terms here reflect the plane stress situation in the plane of the shell, zero stress through the thickness. And all that we are transforming to the global system now here, that fact, that physical fact, of course, must still be reflected in CSH. And that's what's being said here at that point. Uh, if you want to do plastic analysis, creep, creep analysis, you proceed in the same way, but you calculate then, once again, the stress-strain matrix as in the analysis of 3D solids. And having got that, that stress-strain matrix, 6 by 6 matrix, you impose the condition that the stress normal to the mid-surface is zero in much the same way as what we have done uh, here for the elastic. Uh, material condition. Finally, regarding the kinematic descriptions that we talked about for the shell elements, it is interesting to note that also transition elements can be developed. These can be quite useful uh, in practical analysis because they are elements with some mid-surface nodes that carry, in other words, associate director vectors and five degrees of freedom per node and some top and bottom surface nodes with three translational degrees of freedom per node. These elements would be used, for example, to model shell to solid transitions or to model shell intersections. And here you see one such typical element just schematically shown. Here we have a mid-surface node, three translational degrees of freedom corresponding to the stationary coordinate frame, two rotational degrees of freedom, the way we talked about it just now. Mid-surface node here and top and bottom nodes here with three translational degrees of freedom for each of these nodes. Notice we can directly couple 3D solids to this face here and shell elements to this face here. We haven't shown mid-surface nodes here, but you would say have also mid-surface nodes here and then surely a shell element can directly be coupled into here. And such situation is schematically shown right down here on this view graph, where we have solid elements on this side, and transition element right there, and shell elements on that side. Of course, here you would, have, would continue with shell elements. You would continue with solid elements here. And once again, three translational degrees of freedom for these top and bottom surface nodes and five degrees of freedom at shell mid-surface nodes as shown for that node right here. Notice we can also use these transition elements to model shell intersections very nicely as exemplified up here. Well, this brings me to the end of what I wanted to discuss with you in this lecture. Of course, what we have not done yet is to look at example solutions. And what I'd like to do in the next lecture is, first of all, talk
with you about uh, beam elements, the isoparametric beam element, which is formulated much in the same way as the shell elements that we just discussed. And then I'd like to show you applications of the beam elements as well as the shell elements. So uh, please, if you are interested in this subject matter, continue looking at the second tape of this. It's part two of uh, this set of lectures. Thank you very much for your attention.